Hey guys, this is Joe. Today I want to introduce you to our partner Vanta. Achieving ISO 27001 or SOC 2 compliance can unlock major growth for your company and build customer trust, but the process can be time intense and costly. Vanta automates compliance, getting your audit ready quickly and saving up to 85% of associated costs. And Vanta scales with your business, helping you enter new markets. Join 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Quora that trust Vanta. Claim 20% off Vanta at vanta.com forward slash startup radio that's vanta.com spelled v-a-n-t-a dot com forward slash startup radio welcome to startuprad.io your podcast and youtube blog covering the german startup scene with news interviews and live events Hey guys, hello and welcome everybody. This is again Joe from StartupRate.io, the authority on German startups, meaning Germany, Austria and Switzerland, the German speaking area. Today I have two announcements up front. If I'm not on top of my game, I'm really sorry. If you can see in YouTube, I'm taped, so I'm in back pain. Um, and so <laughs> I, I'm not necessarily on top of my game. And then I do have an opening question for you guys. Um, if Excel would be a dating app, what would it be called? And now imagine Jeopardy music. How about the hookup? The reason for this joke is that today I do have Torben here with me. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Totally my pleasure. And the spreadsheet jokes comes from what are you guys actually doing? You guys are rose.com. And as you can already deduce, that is a new spreadsheet app for the API generation. But before we get into that and why on earth anybody would do spreadsheets when there's already Excel from Microsoft and Google Sheets from Google, which are not necessarily the smallest tech companies. They are also known to be quite rich in resources and also very good coders. Um, I would like to first talk a little bit about you, what you're doing and why you are in a phone booth that apparently was constructed by a Dadaist. <laughs> yeah, well, um, where where should I start? Just uh, uh, just what I what I did uh, be before I started becoming founder, or why why I'm in the phone booth? Um, it's uh, I'm I'm here in my office, um, and uh, the phone booth was just is is just my favorite room because it's uh, it's so controlled and uh, and and nicely lit up above me. Yes, exactly. Uh, we, we've been working on, on the lighting for quite some time. And in, in, in some things we tried out, you rather looked like you were from the movie The Shining. Um, so we, we settled on the best we, we could make there. Uh, it's also very good for the audio quality of this interview. So thank you very much for that. What I found pretty interesting is that you speak three languages fluently. German, of course. English, as we can tell, but also French. Um, and you've been to Montpellier. Can you tell us a little bit about what drew you to France and wh what have been your experiences there? Um, well, I, uh, I, I also speak Portuguese, by the way. I, um, I, I used to live in, in Brazil for, for three years, uh, uh, which, uh, which was a great time too. But, uh, indeed, I went first to, to Montpellier. Yeah. And, uh, what drew me to French? Well, I don't really know to be honest. It was just something uh, at 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 high school that I that I liked and uh, that I spent a bit of time on. And then in 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 German high school, you have to choose two specializations, and I uh, I chose French and math. Yeah, and 
And uh, then I went on multiple exchange programs and I liked the language and I liked learning it and, 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 and speaking it. And uh, then when I went to, um, to study at university, I uh, chose a program where I could do a double degree that was in Germany and in, in, and in France. And so, um, and, uh, so I got to spend more than one year there, uh, half of which in, in Montpellier, half of which in Paris. And uh, I had an amazing time. I think from a German perspective, spending some uh, time in the, in the city in southern France, close by the beach and where the weather is nice. And, uh, uh, and then some time in Paris, I think it's, a, it's the perfect mix. Yes, indeed. I've, I've also been to Paris and, and I really loved it, especially the, 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 um, the food there. It's, it's just amazing. And the croissants from Paul's, mm. um, uh, just to challenge, uh, your language skills just a tiny bit before we get further. Uh, what would be the authority on German startups in Portuguese or French or maybe both? The authority, you mean, translating this? Uh, oh, 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 yeah, our slogan, the authority on German startups. I guess in French it would be l'autorité des uh, start-up allemande, uh, or allemand, and in Portuguese it would be autoridade dos startups uh, allemands. Okay, language check. And uh, actually French is such a wonderful language, it always sounds like a love letter. Oh, so great. Um, and uh, after you credited, you've been actually working as a consultant with uh, Roland Berger. What did you do there? And actually, you've also been here in Frankfurt and in Sao Paulo. Yeah, that's right. So, well, after university, so there are different types of entrepreneurs. And um, there are these people who can only found companies and only work on their ideas and, and, and spit them out into the world. They would never be able to work under a boss, etc. I'm not exactly of this type of, of entrepreneurs. So my journey is quite different. I come from a, from a family that I think was quite the opposite of, of entrepreneurship. And um, then after university, I was just absolutely not ready to start founding companies immediately. I think it was... Uh, It was just too scary for me. And then I went into something that I, I, I liked where I could continue learning fast, work with great people and, uh, and stay flexible. And that was for me consulting. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I joined a, a company called Roland Berger, which is uh, uh, quite large in, in Germany, um, uh, one of the larger uh, management consulting firms in Germany. And um, uh, I started actually working in Frankfurt mostly with public sector clients yeah. um, uh, because I, I like that. So making an impact in the public sector um, and, uh, and I started working on mostly organizational topics, for example, for uh, the uh, uh, employment agency here, here in Germany or a couple of these types of, of, of clients. Um, and after two years, um, I Well, me and my wife uh, uh, wanted to kind of a new challenge and, and see something new. And so we um, uh, got to be transferred to Brazil, to Sao Paulo in, in Brazil by our employers. And there I continued to do consulting mostly in the automotive sector. So when, um, when I was there in, uh, I think, 2010, it was the year when Brazilian GDP grew by seven, seven and a half percent. So everybody thought Brazil was the new China and um, uh, everybody wanted to enter the market. And uh, so that gave consultants a lot of work. And, uh, and uh, that's the type of work that I did. Yeah. And then, well, Brazil, unfortunately, did not turn out to be the next China in terms of growth rates, but it's still an amazing country. Yeah, and, and they still have a lot of potential. They have a lot of uh, area, a lot of resources, and a lot of very, very smart young people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Brazil is the country of potential, yeah. So I, 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 I very much hope for them that they can, uh, well, grasp that potential and, and turn it into something real uh, soon. That would be great. And then you did something completely unexpected for consultant. You attended a master's, but a master's in public administration 
at Harvard Kennedy School. And, and before we get into that, everybody who knows that you are, you have been a consultant, everybody knows why you're working with spreadsheets. And I do believe at this point in the interview, only the people who found the first spreadsheet joke funny are still with us here. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It was a great joke. Great joke. Um, so what, why did you not go for the classical MBA? Was it your background? Um, well, I had already studied business in Germany and in France. So I think repeating that again, wasn't really kind of the best thing that I could imagine. Um, I, after five years in consulting, I, I knew that I wanted to get out of consulting because I was kind of tired to give only recommendations, but not really implement decisions and then also be accountable for them. So I, I wanted just more responsibility. But I wasn't really sure in what type of environment yet. So I, I was very interested in international affairs or in kind of, well, diplomacy. But I was also very interested uh, in uh, startups. So in a very particular type of, well, the business world. And um, the place where I could kind of expose myself um, uh, and, and think about both sides uh, was yeah was harvard kennedy school because it was a super flexible two year program where i could kind of improve on kind of soft skill stuff i could expose myself definitely to international affairs and security policy and so on but um i could also cross register across cambridge uh, which included the mit and um and harvard business school and this is where i could pick up all the all the startup relevant stuff and uh, yeah so it was a great time um Well, personally, I, I think also um, to think and make up my mind and then uh, for mostly for practical reasons and because I, I really wanted kind of something very dynamic in the end, uh, I, I chose um, uh, the startup world. And from what you've been also a teaching assistant there, what do you do? What did you do there? J j just ch checked exams? No, no, not at all. Uh, that was uh, that was a really, really interesting experience. So I um, I worked with this professor called Ron Heifetz, and he is uh, kind of a superstar in what is called adaptive leadership. And his class was essentially um, a half circle of students, 120 students in one room, and um, the the it was a case in point teaching method, which meant that the professor would largely sit down and then the students were their own leadership lab. And so people try um, all sorts of things to get kind of the attention and command uh, uh, the agenda of a classroom of 120 people, but without any kind of authority, uh, they get shut down quite soon. And then at any point, people could kind of raise their hand and say, well, I want to debrief what just happened or so, but they might get shut down too. And so over the course of semester, you kind of work your uh, yourself through any sort of, well, leadership dynamic and societal injustices and so on. And, and then you debrief this in small groups, in, in, uh, in case studies that people bring of their own leadership failures from their professional lives. And so as a teaching assistant, I could kind of, orchestrate help orchestrate all this chaos and uh that was fascinating what uh, uh what came came out of it yeah. um when you first talked about all the people talking with each other would i had in mind with uh, the professor sitting there with a big headset you know like like the sledgehammer guys the yellow ones that have on their head and he was just sitting there just observing ignoring words ju just observing the people that that would be a job for me <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah uh, uh it, it sounds like a dream job doesn't it But um, yeah. at, at, at some point he would stand up and then, uh, well, help debrief or find a segue into some sort of leadership framework that we, he would then teach at the example of what, what had just happened, right? And mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of his role. So he, he did a bit more for, for a living than, than uh, sitting around and, and watching chaos unfold. 
Okay, I see. And then you kind of caught the startup bug because from there you, as, as far as I can tell, you went straight to Berlin and started your first startup. What, what did you decide on Berlin and what was the startup all about? Okay. Well, first Berlin. Um, well, I am, uh, I am German. So, uh, uh, I think going back to Germany was, uh, was very much in the cards for me for kind of, well, private reasons, I would say. And, um, and then, um, uh, I, I actually got in touch with a couple of, uh, of people in the Berlin uh, startup world and, um, and started discussing with them. Uh, among them were, um, well, the, the leaders of, of Rocket Internet, uh, Oli Zamva and, and Alex Kudlich, um, and uh, who were at the height of their incubation uh, uh, game, right? So they were kind of taking business models that they saw um, uh, from the U.S. largely and then uh, uh, trying to build the same fast for Europe or uh, some other uh, part of the world. And um, I, um, I uh, found it a great segue for me because at the time I was already a father. I already had a kid, so I couldn't just bootstrap for years um, uh, before, uh, uh, well, I could make any money. So um, I found that as a start, as a segue into the startup world for me, from consulting and from university again or grad school again um, into the role of a founder, um, I uh, thought that this kind of thing with Rocket, where you know that you get less equity, but still a consultant-like salary, um, would be great. Yeah, and uh, uh, and so this is what I did. And then we um, were three co-founders in a company called Eat First, which was uh, completely vertically. Uh, integrated food delivery, um, including um, including the kitchen part. So we used to cook meals and uh, and employ chefs and uh, and build restaurants or build kitchens at least, and then deliver uh, these meals hot uh, and um, and sell them in on on the internet. Sounds like what you call a cloud kitchen, ghost kitchen company. Um, yes, but let's say. Um, a cloud kitchen plus a Uber Eats or Deliveroo or Foodora at the same time, or Vault nowadays. Mm -hmm. Before we get into Rose, I would just uh, like to pick your brain. What do you think about those instant delivery, like grocery food delivery startups you see springing up all over the place, uh, turning into unicorns in less than 12 months? Yeah, uh, well, I think it's it's... It's fascinating, and uh, and I can absolutely see the 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 growth. I'm a I'm a customer myself for sure. Um, after my own experience, I am concerned about um, the the unit economics of these types of businesses and about the long term viability. Um, I uh, I hope that they that these companies will prove me wrong, but uh, I well. As an investor, I would. Pro it's probably not where I would put my money. I think I feel much more comfortable about software. Mm -hmm. Talking about software, then you went on to do your own thing called Rose, which you incorporated 2016 in Berlin. No surprise here. Um, and I would be curious about the reactions of some of your former colleagues, like former consultants, current consultants, and you said, hey, guys, I'm reinventing spreadsheets. <laughs> yes, well, um, consultants specifically are very much in uh, in in Excel's pocket, and I think their their uh, number one problem with uh, Excel is that they cannot, for some reason, abuse it as a database. So just load in SAP data dumps with a million rows, and then crunch that data, and then unfortunately it gets. Uh, it becomes slow, right? And it becomes slow to load and slow to compute and so on. So this, I think, the number one uh, spreadsheet problem in, in consulting. And well, and then with uh, uh, Excel as well, kind of the collaboration part and the version history or, or version control part. Um, but this was actually not the, uh, the the type of problem exactly that we wanted to solve in spreadsheets. We wanted to solve some, something different. But of course, they were, I mean, they were interested as a consultant. I think naturally you're a spreadsheet user, um, but they were also curious, like, 
why there's uh, like we have excel and do you do you want to make a faster excel do you want to make a, 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 an excel that doesn't take a minute to load or this this type of thing i think was the number one question yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i've i've actually been starting to use it and actually it's I would say right now it's not really a competitor of Excel or Google Sheets because it's its own thing because you can do a lot more with, I would say, everything around it. So you do have a lot of connection points, APIs, where you can draw in data, which makes it instantly usable. For example, uh, I've been uh, manually tracking my social media followership for quite some time and actually right now i just had the template i set it up i approved some uh, logins some some data requests with my social media accounts and i had set it up within 15 minutes which i actually use every day and then you do have quite a lot of other interesting stuff some of it, I do believe is really, really amazing because you do get, uh, to pay hundreds of years a month. For example, if you want to have, um, the, the email addresses of CEOs when, when you try to cold, cold mail them or cold call them. And actually what you can do is you set up a spreadsheet. You know, the name of, of the CEO, you know, the URL of the company and boop it'll find it for you that yep. that that is quite amazing plus I, i'm not sure how much other company charge you just to f to keep the uh, track on your social media accounts mm -hmm. well so as a as a bit as a bit of background uh, uh, about the about rows and the types of problems that we want to solve so um we want, um, well, we went into spreadsheets because we thought that there were two essential problems with spreadsheets. So Excel or, well, or VisiCalc, uh, the... Uh, Only two? <laughs> Only two? You sure? Uh, two, two kind of large buckets that we wanted to address. Yeah. Um, so Excel uh, is from, uh, or VisiCalc is from 1979. Yeah. So it was invented uh, more than 40 years ago. And... Um, then the last big spreadsheet in, uh, invention was Google Sheets that was invented in 2006. That was the year before the iPhone was event, invented. Yeah, So mm -hmm. the last big spreadsheet invention is older than the iPhone. And um, with that comes the first problem. So spreadsheets were invented because people really went into smartphones and really went into the app economy. Yeah, And that is um, you cannot share spreadsheets um, nicely on a phone or nice, not nicely at all, really. It always looks like a spreadsheet. Yeah. And with rows, you can turn your spreadsheet into a web page or into a web app into just two clicks. So you take any spreadsheet, say, I want to publish this live as a, as a web app. And then you can pick certain fields like drop downs or buttons or, or check boxes or input fields and uh, uh, make these apps interactive and they will look nice on your phone. The charts will come out uh, uh, nicely. So if you if you ever try to open a Google Sheets uh, on, on, your, on your cell phone, uh, it's, it's usually a nightmare, the experience. And this is kind of one thing that we want to solve. And the second thing is uh, both Excel and Google Sheets were invented before kind of this spread of APIs and of SaaS tools, right? Now we live in this world where all these um, uh, tools need to talk to each other and we're all kind of every knowledge worker is handling five to 15 different tools uh, uh, and, and, and data sources. And um, we wanted to make it easy for people to work with this data. So that's why mm -hmm. we invented kind of integrations and web requests to APIs as functions that you can kind of send from within your cell without the need to actually write a script or a, a Python script, VBA, a Google app script or, or, or the like, you can just use spreadsheet like functions and, uh, and, and work with your data and also automate it, make it execute functions periodically and, and, and so on. So those are the two big things. And then as you rightly mentioned, so uh, you can, that means you can easily use it, for example, for your 
Social Media Tracking, um, uh, uh, track followers across all your social media channels, um, track mentions uh, uh, of, of certain uh, hashtags on Twitter or so. Those would be kind of easy use cases to start with, but you can work kind of into, uh, you can go into full on reporting uh, with a, a nice dashboard, nice set of, of, of charts uh, across, let's say, all your marketing data or um, or all your operations data that you get from an API or, 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 or so. Yeah. But you can also uh, use it to build, for example, internal tools that are, you, you can also publish your spreadsheet as a form uh, and then create databases with the data that is submitted through the form and then define actions based on this data. So there are kind of various ways how to how you can use rows as a, as an automation layer that would not be possible in, in, in normal spreadsheets. And the last thing that you that you mentioned, so we have these integrations that lead actually to public data sources. So for example, you can find the domain for a company name, or you can find the email uh, to the name of a person and the domain, or you can uh, enrich a domain with the LinkedIn information about this company, uh, how many employees they have and so on. Um, uh, so it's a bit like well, Google Sheets has this a little bit with, for example, Google Finance or Google Translate. And we really take this absolutely to the next level yeah, with the kind of publicly available information. Mm -hmm. But uh, just to make sure you, your future scenario is not to, to sell yourself to Google. Uh, no, I, uh, this is absolutely not the plan. Um, I, I mean, we are, we are not dogmatic as, as business people, I would say, but I, I think it would be a waste to sell to Google or Microsoft, um, uh, because it would be a defensive acquisition and, uh, we would probably uh, be shut down after two years or so. So, um, uh, the, the plan would, uh, first and foremost be, um, well, grow on our own and be successful and 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 become a large company ourselves and uh well if we get acquired uh, uh, at some point i would much rather uh, uh sell to a challenger of uh, of these two large uh incumbents uh than than to them uh, to the incumbents themselves Mm -hmm. So we already know a lot about you we kind of get an idea what bros really is admittedly I had to use it, but if you go to rose.com, you can get an account for free and you can start trying stuff out. Uh, that's actually what I did. And um, then I start to understand what are all the possibilities, but there have to be a few use cases you're currently pushing uh, that people out there could use where you see a future in, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I think most people who um, who start using us um, would want to start with something easy, like let's say just privately with stock uh, uh, portfolio tracking or or crypto portfolio tracking. Uh, we have uh, we have a lot of users doing uh, doing that uh, with with rows, where you just um, use an integration to get um, uh, to get your stock or crypto data. You can automate it so that it runs every hour every day or, or every week, depending on how fast you you need updates. And then you can just kind of create beautiful charts and, and consume them, including on your phone, right? And the, and the, and the charts will always be live and updated uh, because you can set these automations in rows very easily. Um, a second thing would, for example, be, yeah, for, for social media accounts like you're using it, Joe. So um, you can... Um, uh, connect your Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and then and then start counting followers. And you can also uh, create a database of these followers. Like every day, you add the current number, and then you see the development of of your followership over time um, in a in a chart. I think this would be kind of a second way. But there are a bunch of marketing integrations, including um, uh, Google Analytics or, or or Google Ads, or well, all the all the ad integrations is is what we have. Some people build these types of reports just with data from their own APIs or with uh, third-party APIs. That is a little more difficult because you need to understand how to use a GET request um, 
but uh, you don't need to uh, you, uh, you don't need to do it in a script. You can just use a function called get and then uh, uh, point to uh, uh, the API endpoint, and then you would get your your data in. Right. But those are kind of very typical things people people start with. And, and looking a little bit in the future, so basically, if you're a startup entrepreneur, you can set it up uh, to track your uh, your ad spending, your social media growth, and match this in graphics and stuff like this. So that is something really great. You can, of course, also put in internal uh, KPIs and stuff like this. I totally assume you can upload data from Google Sheets and Excel into it. Uh, yes, absolutely. So you can um, you can uh, uh, well copy pasting works in both directions. We have an integration with Google Sheets, so you can uh, actually read from Google Sheets and write to Google Sheets through our integration. Um, so uh, and we are about to release our um, our import feature for CSV and XLSX files. So this is not in the product right now, but I think at the time you you publish this episode, it will already be out and 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 people will be able to uh, import their existing spreadsheets easily. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you you are uh, kind of testing out where this is all working where are the like killer uh, applications right now as far as i can see you've already raised series b funding um total 25 million so far and uh the investors are very well known names like sherry ventures atlantic labs excel and uh two business angels so apparently everybody sees that there is a need for better spreadsheets of course also for better spreadsheet jokes if if you have some give give them to us down here in the comments or tweet them at startuprate.io um and um are you currently open to uh to talk to new investors um right now we are we are not really but um but the time will come quite soon so uh, i think by uh, by the end of this year um, we will uh, kind of be looking for for new funding again. So we had um, three rounds of funding led by uh, by Cherry Ventures, then Excel and and Lakestar. So we have uh, we're super happy with uh, with the set of in investors uh, that we have. And yeah, they um, they all believe in the opportunity uh, of of creating a better spreadsheet. It's a it's a huge market with a billion users, right? So um, every seventh person in the world is a spreadsheet user in a way which is uh, which is super large and um, we we see kind of this revolution in productivity tools in general so um, obviously a lot of people are using Microsoft Office and a lot of people are using Google Workspace but there are a lot of challenges uh, 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 popping up like Notion for example or um, or uh, pitch here from Berlin as well for for presentations, and uh, nobody is really attacking the the spreadsheet side. Yeah, um, uh, but uh, there's us. So uh, we uh, we are probably um, trying to uh, uh, pick on the crown jewels of Microsoft Office uh, uh, because it's really kind of the number one productivity tool, um, and uh, uh, we all think that uh, we can build a very very large company just with the spreadsheets right yeah it's uh, it's it's i do believe the first step and um as you said um every uh, 1 billion users of spreadsheet i was wondering uh, only 1 billion and then you said every seventh person in the world i thought yeah that's about right and 50% of them totally hate it <laughs> And they drive them crazy. And therefore, um, we've been both working quite a lot with spreadsheets, I assume. And uh, therefore, we try to make it pretty light. Uh, before we come to the end, I have another one for you. Um, another joke, spreadsheet joke. What do humans and spreadsheets have in common? They are all made out of cells. True. Absolutely. Yeah. The smallest unit yeah, the of life. Yeah. The smallest unit of life. Yeah. It's... Uh, Indeed, true for both. <laughs> Maybe also the smallest unit in finance. <laughs> um, 
Chorgon, it was just a pleasure having you here. Be- before we leave now, are you guys currently hiring? Uh, we are absolutely. So if you uh, if you look at, on our hiring page, uh, rose.com slash hiring, you will see open positions. Um, we actually turned the company um, remote recently. So we we have two offices in Berlin and in Porto, Portugal. Um, and uh, now we are actually hiring uh, across 23 countries. So the US, Brazil and 21 European countries. That was kind of a, a large change that we implemented in the in the last couple of months. And everybody who'd like to learn more, go down here in the show notes. There will be a, a link to our new Medium blog. As of today, we uh, completely changed our setup. There's only landing page and everything we used to have on our website is now on a blog because um, apparently I've lost some hair and most of it is due, of course, to spreadsheets and the uh, and the other part due to uh, keeping this WordPress website uh, working with all the plugs and then went to, uh, plugins that went to war with each other. And so we completely changed the setup here. We now have a medium block and you find it with the show notes down here. Tobin, it was just a pleasure having you as guest. Thank you very much and uh, best of luck. And I, I'm afraid I'm out of uh, spreadsheet jokes right now. Thank you very much. So if, uh, if you still hear this, roast.com, create an account for free. Um, we love to see you as users and i hope you keep using us uh, too joe yeah thanks for having me it was great i had a great time totally my pleasure thanks guys bye bye that's all folks find more news streams events and interviews at www.startuprad.io remember sharing is caring